Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Jeff and Kelsey. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, church. It's good to it's good to be together. We need to be together, by the way. Um, at last night, we were at the Newman House having this little campfire, and it reminded me of um, one of my favorite singer-songwriters. His name is Andrew Peterson, and he said, followers of Jesus are like these orange glowing embers in a fire. If you've ever seen this, you take an orange glowing ember and you put it off by itself alone, and it just kind of gets gray and cold. But when you put a bunch of embers together, you want to know what happens? It, it creates the stirring fire because, because it's together. And that's what, that's what we are. We don't, we don't do this just to play church or have a little religious experience. We, we gather the fire of the people of God and we say, Holy Spirit, burn with your presence and, and wind of God blow and do what only you can do. So, amen? So I'm glad that we're here, and uh, we have a great text this morning, uh, as we always do. What we do here, if you're not that familiar with, with our church, is we open up God's word and we say, speak, Lord, we're listening. I'm not trying to give you a cool talk. I'm trying to say this is what the Lord, the living God of the universe, is saying, and we will encounter him through his word. So Matthew chapter 17, if you've got a Bible, why don't you meet me in Matthew chapter 17, and when you get that uh, turned on or opened up, why don't you stand with me, and I'm just going to read God's word over us like we always do. Matthew 17, verses 1 through 8. Here we go. Matthew 17, 1 through 8. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold... A bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Let me pray for us. Father, uh, I pray that the, the words of your word would be alive and strong in our hearts this morning. I pray that you'd speak by the power of your Holy Spirit. Let the other voices be turned down in volume and let your voice be the loudest voice in the room. And I just pray that we would encounter you like the disciples did. I pray that we'd see Jesus. And that we would leave here forever changed. We love you and we lift this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Um, I've called this, this little sermon, this little message, a holy interruption. Okay? A holy interruption. Uh, when you're interrupted, it means that you're like speaking a sentence and somebody takes over. Right? You have like a train of thought and somebody takes over your train of thought. Or uh, you're kind of in a life moment and something happens and interrupts that life moment. And by the way, uh, there are times when God takes over, okay, where God interrupts our pattern of life because he's got something to say. And this morning, let me just kind of tell you where we're going. Um, the disciples are going to experience a holy interruption. They were doing something that was kind of normal, kind of something that they always did, when suddenly God took over, and they were confused. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't understand. But then God spoke into that moment, and he said, this is actually how I want you to respond in the midst of this holy interruption. He's gonna, we're going to see four things. Okay, let me just preview. We're going to see four things. God is basically going to say, stop. It's time to listen. It's time to listen to my son. Second, God is going to say, it is time for a fresh touch, for a fresh encounter 
from my son. Third, God is going to say, it's time to release fear. And fourth, it's time to focus on the only thing that really matters. All right? And then the story will be over. Okay? And the task of, of preaching, by the way, this is what we try to do every week as preachers, is we take God's word, his timeless word, his timeless stories that reveal his heart, and we bridge it into our world and our moment. And so sometimes when I'm applying that, I'm saying, hey, take this truth and apply it to Monday morning workplace, or take this truth and apply it to your marriage or, or, or your friendships or whatever it is. But let me tell you where I'm going to go uh, this morning. Let me just preview you for where we're going, okay? I believe that in this weird cultural moment that we're in, that I don't really understand. I don't even know how to describe. But these last two years, whatever it is, this COVID moment, and if we're emerging out of it or if we're not, I don't even know how to you know, talk intelligently on that. But here's what I know. I really genuinely believe that we are in the midst of a holy interruption, okay? People were living life, going normal, kind of on their own path, and God ultimately, in the midst of this whole thing, just basically said, stop, okay? There is a pause, Every single one of us for the last two years have experienced some kind of pause. And the thing that we got to really wrestle with is how does God want us to respond in the midst of a holy interruption of all of our lives that we've been walking in? And I'm going to look back at this text, and just like the disciples experienced it, here's what I'm basically going to say to us through the weight of God's word. I'm going to say that ultimately God is saying, stop, and here's what I want you to know. First, it's time to listen to my son. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say that it's time that we tune out some of the other voices. It's time that we tune out some of the other distractions and that we listen to the heart of Jesus for what he wants to be said, for what he wants us to hear in this moment. Secondly, it's time for a fresh touch or a fresh encounter, a fresh experience of our relationship with Jesus right now. Third, there's there's some fear that God wants us to release, okay? There's a releasing of fear. And then finally, there's a focusing on the only thing that matters, okay? How does God want us to respond amidst a holy interruption? And whether we talk about these last two years or whether God, even in this moment of your life, or put this in your back pocket because another moment of your life, there will be a moment when God says, stop your little plan, I've got something to say to you, and I want us to respond right, okay? So are you ready? Everybody, everybody good? Everybody know where I'm going? All right. Matthew 17, verse 1. Let's get after it. Matthew 17, verse 1. Here's how the text starts. It says, Matthew 17, verse 1, And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother, and let them up a high mountain by themselves. Now, contextually, can I have it on the screen, please? Contextually, it's important to pause and ask the question. If he starts out this story by after six days, what happened six days ago? And why is he pointing to the time frame of six days? What's going on in the context? Okay, if you were with us last week, you remember that six days ago, there was a major turning point, like a, a pivot point in the ministry of Jesus. They had an important conversation. You remember where they were? They were up in this place called Caesarea Philippi. It was this mess of this pagan worship, like this buffet of all these like fake gods, fake little temples. Everybody would go there and worship whatever they wanted to worship. So much, so much of a mess that it was called the gates of hell by the locals. And Jesus had a message for them in the gates of hell. He brought them up sat them down on this ledge, looked them in the eyes, and asked a critical question. Here's the question. He said, who do people say that I am? Meaning, what's the word on the street about me? Or like, if, if social media, like back in the ancient world, like, like what's the commentary out there? What are people saying? What are people debating about me? And the disciples were like, hey, some Jesus... Some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, some, I don't know, it's a mixed bag, Jesus. People don't know how to categorize you. 
then he paused and he took it out of the theoretical and into their hearts. He took it out of the, what are others saying, and into something so critical. Please, everybody look up at me. I feel very led to be as bold as I'm about to be, okay? Jesus looked him in the eyes and said, all right, out of the theoretical and into your heart, who do you say that I am? Who do you who do you say that Jesus is because eternity hangs in the balance of how you answer that question? Is he the king or is he your king? Is he the savior? You know, the Christmas story is coming up, blah, blah. Or has he rescued you, saved you? Have you made him the savior of your life? Have you laid your life before Jesus? Jesus is saying, enough about what the crowd says. I'm looking at you, my disciples. I'm looking at you, the ones who call yourselves my followers. Eternity hangs in the balance. Who do you say that I am? All right? Jesus was saying that to them. Please don't miss this. Jesus is saying it to every person in this room. Don't just live a good, soft, Christian, feel-good life. Show up at church every once in a while. Know the stories and not commit your life to Jesus because that's all that matters. Come on, that's all that matters. We're not playing some stupid game here. He's saying he's the savior of the world and he wants to be your savior. And Jesus is like, who do you say that I am? Peter spoke for the group and he said, you are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. And Jesus is like, yes, that's it. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. On this rock, on this truth that I'm the Christ, the son of the living God, we're going to build something and we are on offense and I have the football and the gates of hell are Apparently like the Michigan State defense, like, like they will not stop me. I have the football and we will win and the gates of hell will not stand against my church. That's what Jesus said. And the disciples were like, okay, let's go. Let's go. And then Jesus turned the conversation. You remember last week? Jesus said, all right, then let me tell you how it's going to shake out. We're going to go down to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be rejected, accused, beaten, and I'm going to die. And by the way, anybody that wants to follow me, like it's not necessarily a pretty soft, wonderful life. You're actually going to be rejected, accused, and in your own way, you're going to have to pick up your cross and follow me. And the disciples were like, what? What's he talking about? And, and his public popularity was like, what is he talking about? And from this point in Matthew on, it just goes downhill, downhill, downhill until, catch this, he dies naked and alone on a garbage dump outside of the city. And then three days later, he rises from the grave. Okay? That's the story of Jesus, but it took a major turn six days ago, and he's like, who do you say that I am? And then this story ends, look at chapter 16, verse 28. If you're, if you're looking at your text, look back right before chapter 17, and it says, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Meaning Jesus says, and, it, and Mark, who's another gospel writer, also talks about this, and he says it like this. He says, there are some of you who will be here today and you will not die until you see the kingdom of God in power, okay? Meaning you'll see the Son of Man, kingdom of God, in a beautiful display of power. I think he was pointing to this moment, okay? Six days later, they took him up a mountain, okay? And let's look at verses one through three, okay? Here we go. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Okay, they started out doing something kind of normal, like kind of normal flow of life. Jesus was always going up on a mountain to pray. He was often bringing his buddies up on a mountain to pray. But as he was doing that, suddenly something happened that was anything but normal, okay? A holy interruption happened. God took over and said, I'm about to change the story. 
and he was transfigured before them. Okay, this word transfigured, it's the Greek word metamorphote, and it means a transformation from the inside out. Okay? Not the outside in, but an inside out. So if in your mind you're hearing this scene and you're picturing kind of like the painting of Jesus all alone or maybe with his friends on a mountain and, and like the sun or the moon reflecting and glowing in the face of Jesus, that's not what happened. Okay? That's not what it was. He transformed from the inside out. Something within him just lit the whole surrounding. He, another gospel writer says, he altered. And then, then they're kind of grasping for words. Like, how do we describe it? He was transfigured and his face shone like the sun. I love that description. Matthew's like trying to grab words here. And he's like, I don't know what metaphor to describe his face. Maybe the most powerful source of heat and light in the universe. I guess his face looked like that. In his clothes, they were white. They were, another gospel writer says, dazzling white, like you could never bleach it white. His clothes were white, Matthew says, white as light. Jesus transfigured, he transformed, and the Son of Man, all of a sudden, he altered into his state of glory. Okay. And suddenly, everything, it just changed. Suddenly, it changed. Okay. And then, if that were enough, next what happens, it's kind of hard to describe. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now, what, what is that all about? Why is it like, there's Jesus and there's Moses and Elijah? Now, in, in biblical world, it would be to the Jewish mind, it would be difficult to, um, to underestimate how significant this moment would be. Um, to the Jewish mind, this would have been considered the big two representatives of the Old Testament. Okay, if you've ever heard the phrase, the law and the prophets, Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. These were the two figureheads of the law and the prophets. Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. So can I just unpack Moses and Elijah real quick? I'll do it very quickly. Moses, everybody remember Moses? Exodus, let my people go, big staff, white hair, Charlton Heston, Moses, um, burning bush, Moses on the mountain, Exodus chapter 32 and 33. The glory cloud of God's presence was there. And Moses goes to God and says, God, will you show me your glory? And God's like, no, I actually can't do that because if you see me face to face, you're dead. But here's what I'll do, Moses. I will let my glory pass over you. I will hide you in a cleft of a rock. I'll put my hand covering the cleft of the rock. And as I pass over with my afterburn of my glory, I'll kind of open up my hand and let you see the afterburn of my glory. And he did that. And Moses was so transformed by the presence of the glory of God that, catch this phrase, ready? He was reflecting the glory of God. And he came down off this mountain and had to wear a veil because when he would take off the veil, he was shining, reflecting the glory of God. Moses represented the law and he reflected the glory of God. Elijah stood for the prophets. The prophets were the ones who boldly heard and declared the word of the glory of God. Okay, so Elijah, you remember Elijah? He was the one that, like, for example, on Mount Carmel, uh, he's in his little showdown with the prophets of Baal, with Baal, somebody say. And he was like, I'll tell you what, why don't we have a little showdown? You call down fire, I'll ask God to call down fire. Whoever calls down fire actually wins. So 700 prophets of Baal, they're like circling around and worshiping, worshiping, worshiping. Nothing happens. And God's, and Elijah's like, all right, God, would you send down fire? Bam. And then he runs. And he goes to Mount Horeb. And he goes up in a cave. And he's feeling all depressed. And suddenly he experiences the glory of God. Do you remember the story? God wanted to speak to him. And he was like, is it in the wind? No, God's not speaking in the wind. Is it in this fire? No, God's not in the fire. And then he hears the gentle whisper of the word of the Lord. And the glory presence of God was there. And he went out and proclaimed the glory of God. 
And in this scene, and again, to the, to the Jewish mind, this would have been transformative. That's kind of hard to understand in 21st century America. But th- this is like, Peter, James, and John would have been like, wait a second, there's the one that reflected the glory of God. There's the one that proclaimed the glory of God. And now in the middle is Jesus, and he's just not reflecting. He's just not proclaiming. He is revealing the glory of God. He is the glory of God. He's the glory of God lived out in human form. He is the word of God. And Peter would have been like, what? Like, this is the big three. Like, like, like in NBA world when they're like, there's the big three playing on the team. In the world of Jewish mind, it would be like, there's Moses, there's Elijah, and now there's Jesus. And so let me show you how Peter responded to it. I think this is hilarious. Um, Let me show you how Peter responded to this kind of chaotic, confusing, they don't know what's going on moment. Verse 4, here's Peter's response. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Here's ultimately what Peter was doing. He was like, I don't know what's going on, so I'll start talking. I'll start doing, I'll just like, like, what, what should I do? And so let me show you, actually, th- this is the one that I really think is hilarious. This is Mark chapter 9, verse 5 through 6. Okay, um, and Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and then watch what he says. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Do you, do you have anybody in your life, or are you like this, by the way? Um, if you don't know what to say, you think the best strategy is to start talking because you don't know what to say. Um, and by the way, I think there's a little insight in here how not to respond in a holy interruption. Okay. Here's, here's what Peter did. Actually, scholars aren't exactly sure what Peter was doing because it says he didn't even know what he was doing. But here's the conjecture of what We think he was doing, even though he didn't know what he was doing. We think that Peter was saying, hey, when it comes to like a tent or a booth or in that day and age, a memorial, that was a way, especially during the Feast of Booths, to show this person is a big deal. Let's pause and memorialize that this is a big deal. And so Peter's like, I I don't know what I should do. How about we do a building project? Like, how about we start doing, and it, like, I'll build one for you to show you're a big deal. I'll build one for you to show you're a big deal. I'll build one for you to show you're a big deal, and we'll just do this thing. We can all, like, acknowledge that we're a big deal. And he starts talking and talking and talking until ultimately God said, please don't miss this. God said, stop. God said, we're pausing right now. God said, incredibly important for our culture right now, followers of Jesus. God said, in the midst of this confusing, chaotic moment where a lot of people don't understand, I want to call pause. Because there's a way that I want you to respond. There's something that I want you to learn. Peter, stop stop talking. I love you. Stop talking. There's something you need to hear, okay? And just like Amy in in the early part of the service said, we need our eyes to be healed, to see. I think that's true. And I think God's about to say, and I need your ears to be healed. Because there's something that I want you to see and something that I want you to hear, okay? And four responses. Four responses if you're taking notes, okay? I think God was saying it's time to do Uh, four things, okay? Here's the first one. Uh, Verse five. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Here's the first thing. It's time to listen to Jesus. It's time to listen to Jesus. Let me say that a third time. It's time to listen. I love that God was like, this is my son. I am so well pleased with my son. And the greatest thing that you can do in this moment is to listen to my son. To the disciples, it's like the king of the universe is here. 
And it would be important for you to seek his heart on what he wants you to learn. And I still think he's saying that to us. Sometimes I think, and I'm speaking this on behalf of me and on behalf of you guys, that one of the most difficult things in our walk with the Lord is God just getting us to pause and to listen to what he wants us to hear. Can I tell you wrongly, a lot of my life, a lot of my prayer life is, okay, God, I'm about to pray, so here we go. Here's the things I'm frustrated with. Here's the things I'm concerned about. Here's the things I'm requesting for you. Here's the things I want your perspective on. And I talk, 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 say amen, and walk away and say, I think that was a pretty good prayer time. And I think what God wants us to do is to learn how to listen, okay? And let me tell you just two insights in how to listen from the Lord, okay? First of all, this comes from um, the, the founder of YWAM. His name is Lauren Cunningham, and he said, it's so important to listen to the Lord. Here's some insights how to listen to the Lord. And my family and I were talking about the, this week. It's very profound, I think. He said three things. He said, first, ask the Lord by his power, by his authority, by the power of his blood to silence all distractions and lies that are, that are vying for the attention of your mind. If you want to listen to the Lord, set apart some time and say, God, first and foremost, I recognize that there is spiritual, like, battle in this moment because the enemy does not want me to hear and by the power of the blood of Jesus I just want to silence all lies and all distractions because I want to listen to you. He said secondly um, surrender your own will and your agenda and even your own intuitions and thoughts. Like to have a time to say Lord like I want to pause and I want to confess first of all anything in my heart that's not of you. Second all my ideas that I bring to the table, I just want to surrender it to you, Lord. And then third, to wait on the Lord to hear him. And let me just add this insight to waiting on the Lord. Often that comes with an open heart and an open Bible. Meaning, God, I'm opening up my heart to, to you. By the power of your spirit, would you gently whisper to me? Would you nudge to me? I want to hear your voice. And I'm opening up your word saying, here is a clear, pure way to hear your voice. God, direct me to your word. Is there anything you want me to hear? So even yesterday, like I've, I was feeling like empty and distant from God. I was like, I need to hear from the Lord. So I went out to the woods, was hiking around. And first I was just saying, all right, God, by your power, by the authority of Jesus, I just ask that you would help cut out all distractions, all lies that are, that, are, that are warring on my heart and on my mind. God, secondly, I confess, I surrender. I just, I just lay all of my ideas before you, and I want to be an open slate that hears your voice. And then I opened up God's word, and I opened up my heart to the Lord, and I said, would you lead me? Would you guide me? Would you let me listen to you? Okay? And I think that's part of the process of walking with God, learning how to listen to the Lord. Amen? Okay, now let me push on you. I push on myself, but let me push on you. Followers of Jesus in the 21st century, part of listening to the Lord, ready, is turning down all the other voices in your life that want to be louder than the voice of the Lord. And a lot of these voices are actually good voices. So here's what I'm about to say. Ready? Media in your life can be good. Social media in your life can be good. Listening to podcasts can be good. Watching debates on whatever news station of choice can be good. Hearing the opinions on Facebook can be good. Hearing the debates of your friends on different political issues or whatever it is can be good. However, they can also be very loud when you have so many voices and so many sources and so many things vying for your attention, it's easy for the voice of the Lord to be drowned out. And sometimes it's almost like a moment like what happened in this story. God's saying, hey, can we just pause and turn off all the other voices and listen to my son because he has something to say. All right? That's the first thing, I think, of how he wants us to respond in a holy interruption. It's time to listen to the Lord. Okay, second thing, it's time for a fresh touch from Jesus, verses 6 through 8. 
I love this. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, rise and have no fear. Okay, so picture the scene. Here are the followers of Jesus. Here's the disciples. And they are face down before the Lord. They're terrified. They don't understand. They don't don't know what to do. And Jesus, who's just transfigured, shining like the sun, just like in all his glory, what does Jesus do? He stops and he touches them. And the question is, like, why did he touch them? Like, he didn't, he didn't need to just kind of reach out his hand and, and touch them. And we see this throughout different parts of the Bible. Um, when God, like, didn't need to, like, touch the person. And even law would say, don't touch the person. But he did it anyways. Do you remember the leper? you remember the man with leprosy? Totally illegal to touch someone with leprosy. And Jesus was about to heal him. He didn't need to touch him. It was illegal. He didn't need to touch him. But he pauses the scene. He's like, Let me touch you. I want you to have this fresh encounter with me. I want you to know I care about you. Um, Or one of my favorite stories is in Luke 7 when um, the widow's son dies and there's a funeral procession and there's a coffin and Jesus walks right up and does something highly illegal, punishable by death. He reaches out and he touches the coffin. Everybody stops. He tells the boy to get up. Or I love... um, I love what Thomas, after the resurrection, he's like, Thomas, come here, just touch me. And I think, and I'm I'm not certain about this, but I think that what Jesus was doing was something like this, okay? I think Jesus was saying, in the midst of the mystery that you don't understand right now, in the midst of this confusing, chaotic time that you don't get, I want to show you that I'm here in the middle of the mystery, and I love you, and I'm with you. And as I was studying this text, the thing that I I was actually most moved about when I was studying this text is that um, God didn't explain himself. Like he didn't, Jesus did not explain what he was doing, why he transfigured, why there was Moses and Elijah, why, like why he would go up on a mountain and transfer, like, like often throughout the scriptures, he does something and then he's like, and this is what I'm doing. This time he did something and he just let it be a mystery. And I don't know about your relationship with Jesus, but often in my relationship with Jesus, I don't know what he's doing. Like there's all kinds of times that I don't understand God. He's very mysterious to me. And I think what God might just be doing in this is saying, hey, even though I'm not going to always explain myself, I want you to know that I'm with you in the middle of this mystery. And I think in times where, where God kind of interrupts our life, or even in this big, like, COVID chaos, he's, everything is paused. I think Jesus is saying, hey, by the way, in a way that's stronger than you might have ever experienced before, I want to be with you. Like, like, I literally want you to walk with me and know me and experience my presence. And I think a sweet and kind and tender prayer that God loves to respond to is, Jesus, I want a fresh encounter with you. Like, like, I want to know you, not just know about you. I want to know you in a real, deep, transforming way. And I'll fall down and be terrified worshiping you, but I'm longing for the touch of the Savior. Okay? It's time, is what he was saying. It's time. And then watch this. I love this. When we experience God, when we walk with God, often, biblically, it's tethered to what happens next. When people experience the presence of the Lord, the next phrase is one of the most common phrases all throughout the Bible. As if when we understand God and walk with God, this is the natural overflow. It's time. Can I have the next text? I'm sorry. Stay here. Verse 7. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. It's time to release fear. I believe boldly and profoundly that more than ever before in our culture, Christians are riddled with fear. I believe that the enemy is using fear, just the distraction of fear, in so many ways, in so many shapes and sizes. And when we walk with Jesus, something that he loves to do is to say, as you focus on me and walk with me and trust in me and hear from me, something that happens is the chains of fear 
are unshackled from you. So I want to even ask you this. Um, just, uh, and I want you to take some time meditating on this. Maybe when we do communion and maybe throughout this week. Is there any area of your life where, where honestly, it's just a battle of fear that's rising up in you? Like, they, like you're anxious about something. And cyclically, you keep coming back to this, this, uh, this fight in fear over something. And uh, I've done this. I've walked with this. I've been anxious about things many times throughout my life, many times throughout this last month. I think what God is teaching me, and I think I can stand in some biblical authority on this, is that the strategy to overcome fear is not on focusing on the thing that gives you fear, but focusing on Jesus who's triumphant over fear. As we walk with him, as we hear from him, as we seek him, like he gives victory over that which is fear. Sometimes our circumstances don't change, but it's just this deepening of trust that we have as we, as we walk f- with him and experience his presence in the midst of it. But Jesus is like, I'm touching you. Rise and let fear go in my presence. And then, finally, a fourth point. It's time to focus on the only one that matters. And I want to show you one of my favorite sentences in the Bible. Okay? I love this sentence. I love how the story ends. Okay? And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Isn't that beautiful? Here's how the story ends. Like there, there's Moses and Elijah. There's shining light. There's, there's the three disciples, and there's confusion. There's chaos. There's misunderstanding. There's mystery. They're face down, touch of Jesus, rise up, and suddenly there is no more chaos. There is no more confusion. There's no more Moses and Elijah. There is nothing but Jesus only. And the story ends with them focusing on Jesus and walking back down the mountain with Jesus. And I know this is a simple point, but this is an everything point, that it's time, followers of Christ, for our our focus, our attention, to be in the only one that truly matters. And I'm I'm almost done, but let me kind of close this message like this. Okay, you know this, but we are going to, we're going to blink, and this life as we know it will be done. The Bible says that life is like a breath says it's like a, a flower in a field that fades. And there will be one thing that matters, and it's not the amount of money in your 401k. It's not the title that you achieved. It's not, like, it's not even how much quality of life you experienced on earth. There will be one thing that matters, okay? One thing. You peel back heaven right now. There are angels around a throne focusing on him. All of heaven is knelt down before him. There is one thing that matters, and it's the great joy. And let me tenderly tell you something. Yesterday, Dick Miller and I were in a hospital room, and yesterday, Pat Miller went home to be with the Lord, okay? Thursday night, Pat Miller was there, behind a table, right there, serving 250 meals to people in this church and and in this community through the YMCA. With joy, with vibrancy, she was Friday, she had a stroke. And can I tell you what Pat would tell us right now? Like if she took the face mic and stood here right now, she would say, let me speak to you on behalf of heaven. There's only one thing that matters. There's only one thing worthy of our attention. There's only one thing that matters. There's only one name lifted up and it's none of our names. And in the name of Jesus, all other things will fade. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And she would say, that's what it's going to be like. Why don't you live life now like it'll be then? Why don't you live like now like I'm experiencing now? There's one thing that matters. There's one thing. And one day there will be a trumpet. Clouds will part Jesus will be on a white horse, hair like wool, blood drip robe, sword coming out of his mouth, and it will be God saying, it's time, it's time. 
I'm calling that it's time. Whatever you're going on in life, there's a holy interruption, and it's now. And the Bible says every knee will bow and tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And if in that moment we will say, okay, the only voice we want to listen to is his voice. The only attention we want to have is on him. Let us be people that do that now. Let's live like that. Let us be people that in an unbelieving world will look at Antioch and they'll say, hey, unlike my other experience of Christians, they're not fighting about politics and going back and forth on, on Facebook and they're not all jacked up concerned with everything else on this earth. They are so zoned in on Jesus. They're so zoned in on him. What is it about their relationship with Jesus? Because that's the only thing that will ever matter. Let's not settle for lesser things. Let's not settle for lesser things. The night before Jesus was crucified, he took bread, he took wine, he broke it, he poured it. He said, this is my body broken for you and poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And as we, as we close in communion, worship team, would you come on up? As we close in communion, I want you to take some time with your heart before the Lord focusing on him. And if you're a follower of Jesus, I would love for you to take communion in almost this, I want to repent and return to my number one focus. In this, God, are there other voices vying for my attention? Okay, would you let me turn them down? I want to focus on you. And then in celebration, we're going we're gonna to stand together and worship the Lord. So let me, let me pray for us. And then after, I'm, after I do, there are communion elements behind the pillars and out there. Why don't you go ahead and get um, communion elements, and then we'll take a time of just sacred communion. Jesus, we love you. I lift this church to you. This is your bride. You are the shepherd. You're our king. You're the groom. And we don't want our lives to be about other things. So, Lord, we know that that's sometimes easy to say um, in a Sunday morning church service, but so hard to apply to normal life. So help us do that, God. Help us live in the same understanding that these disciples went through. And that when all else faded away, all that was left was you. We love you and we lift this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Spend some time with God. Take communion and then let's stand and worship.